Hey everybody, welcome to the PC Perspective Mailbag. We're going to call this the holiday edition, even though there are zero holiday-themed questions or answers in the show. But uh, it's close to Christmas. Ken's behind us doing some some benchmarking. of a su- is it, It's not a super secret graphics card. I'm just not going to tell you what it is. So there, now you know. Uh, let's, let's go ahead and jump into things, guys. Colby Perry wants to know, I currently have a PC with a Core i3-6100, a GTX 1060 6-gig card, and a 1080p display that I use for gaming. Uh, he mentions Destiny 2 and Wolfenstein 2, and occasional VMs for work. I want to upgrade, but can only afford to do one component first. For my needs, would it be best to upgrade to a better Skylake CPU, a GTX 1070 or 1080, or pick up a 1440 display? Uh, Colby, this question uh, we get a lot, and it's going to differ per person, right? You, you mentioned the games you're playing, Destiny 2 and Wolfenstein 2, definitely high-end titles. You have a 1080p display. Um, you mentioned occasional VMs for work, but you don't really say what work they are. I mean, the Core i3 processor is probably uh, going to be – oops, sorry – it's going to be your biggest bottleneck for some of those VM and compute workloads. Um, the GTX 1060 6 gigabyte is still a fantastic card, especially for a 1080p display. Uh, I, I would probably say the processor, um, but I, I'd have to look and see what prices you get for what performance you get. Right. So if you're on a six, you can get a 6700K. If you can find those relatively cheap, you know, um, that's kind of going to be a pretty significant perf lift for you. It won't really affect games very much, but it might affect your, your VM work uh, that you do. I Of the other two, you know, a 1070 or a 1080 is going to be a significant gaming improvement for you. Uh, and I'm still a strong believer that a higher resolution display, be it 1440p or 4K or whatever, uh, in, in a bigger display can have significant impact on how you you feel when you're actually using the computer. The problem is, I I would hesitate to tell you to upgrade to a 1440p monitor without also getting that higher end GPU to power it. The 1060 uh, GTX 1060 6 gig is probably pretty good for Wolfenstein 2 and Destiny 2, at least Wolfenstein 2 at 1440p. Um, but you know, Destiny 2 might be a struggle, and any future games would likely be a struggle in that regard too. So it's kind of like I, I would want you to upgrade those in a pair or you shell out now for like a GTX 1080 today, you keep your 1080p display knowing that you have an overpowered graphics card for that monitor uh, and plan to upgrade the monitor as the at the next available convenience, right? Maybe ask for it for Christmas from somebody. I don't know. Just a thought. Next question comes in from Antonio Cunningham. Says, why do you think that people, this is ironic, why do you think people are still buying 1440p displays when 4K monitors are now available and affordable? Um, There's a couple of reasons for that, right? So for one, some people, so when you get into a 4K display, you have two problems. One, you have display scaling, right? If you're in Windows and you're using uh, Office products or web browsing, uh, a lot of times people, including myself, have difficulty with um, really small text, really small fonts uh, and pictures. And so you ended up turning on Windows scaling up to 125, 150%. But then you run into issues with Windows scaling not being perfect and some applications like, I don't know, Steam still not really operating correctly in that environment. Uh, another reason you may not want to upgrade your 4K monitor is you don't have the GPU compute to power it right? Um, you know, there's no need to have a 4K monitor if you know your graphics horsepower is going to limit you to 1080p or 1440 or some something around those ranges, right? So uh, it, that would kind of be why. Also, you can, you can get 1440p monitors and higher refresh rates than you can 4K displays, right? So you can get 1440p, you know, 100, 120, 144 hertz monitors that allow you get uh, allow you to get a really good balance of resolution and refresh rate. While at 4K, you're still kind of lim- you're not kind of you're still limited to 60 as that peak, unless you get into some some overclocking stuff. So, um, you know, that that's why people I still think are buying 1440. It's why you still see people going into the new new form factors like. Um, uh, 3440 by 1440. These ultra wide panels is another reason to do that. Uh, you know, graphics horsepower and just individual use cases. I'm still using two 2560 by 1600 monitors on my uh, desk here, and I have plenty of access to 4K displays. The problem is, I need the 4K displays to be bigger before they're useful. 
Otherwise, if I keep them at the same size, I would probably turn on scaling, and in which case, window scaling is still not good enough for me to feel like uh, I would want to use it full time. You know, I do use it on my laptop. There are still applications every once in a while that that, that choke on it. So, Daryl Austin wants to know: Can you explain how PCIe lanes work on the Z370 chipset? Is it true that the SATA and M.2 ports are shared, uh, or those ports share bandwidth and the USB and Ethernet? Uh, or with USB and Ethernet I.O.? If so, would having one by 16 GPU, two SATA SSDs, and one M.2 SSD work? Would it force the GPU to run it by eight or otherwise slow the system down? Um, so your, your question asks about PCIe lanes on the Z370 chipset, but what I think is important to note is on that platform, you are getting 16 lanes of PCIe from the processor. And those 16 lanes are only divided between the PCIe slots, the add-in card slots on the motherboard. So if you have one video card in place and nothing in that uh, secondary PCIe slot, then that video card is getting by 16 bandwidth, which is good, but not, you know, if it were running it by eight, that would be fine for a single card because the card's not really transferring data to another GPU for multi-GPU, whatever. Um, the chipset itself uh, connects to the processor through a DMI connection, which is actually really just a PCI interface with some additional protocols uh, in place. Um, those are separate from the 16 lanes you get from the processor and separate from the lanes that exist on the Z370 chipset itself. Um, now, the lanes that exist on the chipset are divided up in a number of different ways, and it really comes down to the motherboard implementation itself, right? You ask, uh, is it true that SATA and M.2 ports share bandwidth? Uh, they can, um, and it depends on how the motherboard vendor implements it. So if you have a motherboard that has two M.2 slots, for example, chances are one of them will work while all the SATA ports work, but if you want to use the second M.2 slot, it will disable two of the SATA ports. If you have a motherboard that has SATA Express on it, that is likely going to be something that is sharing PCIe allocation with an M.2 uh, port as well. Um, USB and Ethernet are generally given uh, enough connectivity options. That's not a, that's not a, that's not a deal for connectivity, like for it to be enabled. Uh, but we have seen instances where you know USB controllers are running at slower speed levels if you have more SATA ports or PCIe uh, connections made through those chipset uh, lanes. Um, so those are two separate things, right? In general, nobody should or does run their GPU on lanes coming from the chipset on Z270, Z370 platforms because you're, you know, people who are going more than two GPUs are really, really, really limited. Um, but I, I think... The answer to your question, Daryl, is complicated, and it really depends on the motherboard itself. So if you if you know the motherboard you're going to buy, you know the motherboard you have, go to the website, download the PDF, chances are it will give you some diagram or some information about how the designations are broken up. And I'll be honest with you, it's, sometimes it's not easy to read or understand what they're, what they're saying, uh, but feel free to ask questions on forums and Reddit or whatever and see uh, if, if somebody can help break down exactly what that motherboard is doing. But um, yeah, hope that helped. Aeon wants to know, can using an underpowered PSU damage your PC components or itself? For example, using a power supply rated at 500 watts when the system's power draw is 600 watts. Um, so if you have a 500 watt power supply and you try to draw 600 watts through it, it's not going to work, more than likely, right? If you have a really well, like super over-engineered power supply, it may, for some period of time, work, uh, and then it will suddenly stop. You'll have caps that bust or something like that. The, the risk of damage to the PC components has been minimized quite a bit over the years. We've, we've had better OCP, overcurrent protection, um, applied to motherboards and better shutoff and safety mechanisms on power supplies. However, it's still possible for that to occur. And, it, and it's possible for that to occur even if you're not even if you're not overdrawing that power supply it could happen through a power surge or just some random defect in the power supply could fizzle, send down some uh, unwanted current 
to your graphics card or motherboard and cause some damage that way. But it, it seems to be fairly minimized up to this point. I would say if you have a power supply rated at 500 and you're trying to draw 600, you are asking for trouble. But I think more than likely what will happen is the power supply shuts down uh, and the system shuts down and you can reboot back into that system usually safely. Right? When, when people do... Um, you know, cryptocurrency mining. This is something that would happen a lot in test systems that we would have here. You know, we'd have a thousand watt power supply, and we were drawing, you know, ten hundred, you know, thousand fifty or close to eleven hundred watts. And you'd watch it, and you and you could do it for some amount of time, but eventually it would all shut down, uh, and you do have a little bit of an added risk of it damaging components. But I don't think it's very high. I would just say, uh, don't put yourself in that situation. Um, don't. Try to draw more than your power supply can can uh, provide. Lee, who does excellent, amazing power supply reviews on PCPer.com, uh, generally tells you to have a twenty percent cushion, right, on your power supply. So if you think you want to draw eight hundred watts peak with your components, then have a thousand watt power supply. Uh, so do that math instead, and then uh, sleep a little bit better at night while your PC is running. <laughs> a question from Kilo Graham. Wants to know: Does Infinity Fabric have to be matched to the system's memory speed, or will it eventually be able to be overclocked independently? Um, so right now, the Infinity Speed Fabric on Ryzen processors is tied to the speed of the memory, or you probably would word it the other way: the memory speed is tied to in in Infinity Speed Fabric. I don't think it's actually one to one. I think there's a ratio involved, um, meaning that. The Infinity Fabric might be running at half of the speed, but as long as it is an even multiple, that's how these communication things can work. I could easily see a time uh, or an instance where, say, in the Zen 2 architecture, they design these two buses to be asynchronous. And it may actually relieve them of some of the problems, right? It would allow them to uh, clock memory higher or clock the uh, Infinity Fabric higher in order to facilitate better chip-to-chip -chip and core-to-core -core and you know module-to-module uh, uh, -module communication without forcing you to have higher speed memory. Now, there'd be trade-offs of what the advantages of that would be, but it would give uh, the system implementers a little bit more flexibility in that regard, right? So, uh, I, I, don't, I don't think we're going to see that happen in the current architectures. Like, that's not going to change uh, for Ryzen or Epic or Threadripper as it exists today, but for the next generation, I see that as n probably not even just likely, or not even possible, but probably likely as well for them to have. It's just... The next iteration of the architecture is a little bit smarter, a little bit uh, more understanding of how things work, where the advantages are and disadvantages are, and they uh, adjust accordingly. Question from Shambles wants to know, do you have any information on the availability of Intel's wireless AC9260 card? It was first announced in May, but I've yet to see it available at retail or integrated into any new laptops. It supports uh, Bluetooth 5, increased range, seems like an important feature for those considering wireless headphones. Uh, I actually don't know anything about this card other than um, I believe you'll see some stuff at CES about this and technology integrating stuff from Intel's uh, uh, wireless controllers. Um, but I don't, I don't think there have been, there's not any like secret releases that I'm aware of uh, for it. Um, although Bluetooth 5 is interesting, I don't think there's a lot of devices that support it yet. But CES here coming up in the next two weeks is really where you would see something like that uh, championed. But I will, I will say Intel does a... Uh, I don't want to say a bad job, but they don't overly promote their wireless controllers, even you know the ones that have come out in the last couple of years. You just kind of, you know, will will receive one of them uh, with an Intel Nook that we happen to be benchmarking or something like that, and then we'll be able to use that, do some other testing, implement it in other systems, and and get a feel for it like that way. So check uh, check back with me mid uh, mid January 2018, and we'll see uh, what Intel has to say there. <coughs> Next question, Monkadelic D wants to know, what's your opinion of Windows Mixed Reality headsets versus the Vive or Rift? Is the display quality similar? Do they offer any other advantages other than price? Are they compatible with games like Racing Sims and Elite Dangerous? Um, I have uh, personal experience with only one of the Windows Mixed Reality headsets. And um, my general consensus is they're cheaper for a reason. right? The, the, the display quality is not as good. Um, the tracking quality is not as good. The... Um, 
the setup process, at least the last time I looked at it, uh, admittedly has been probably a month or more, was 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 bad as well, trying to get it set up. And we kind of have a lot of empty space here, so it should have been something that's relatively easy. And it's going to be more complex for people who are trying to set this up at a work environment at their desk. You know, it's messy, it's cluttered, there's things in the way. Maybe you have microphone arm booms hanging in front of you. Chances are most of you don't, but maybe that's a thing. Um, I would say for the price point, they're still providing a pretty good experience. Um, although, to me, the whole idea of this Windows Mixed Reality uh, is the ability to like work inside that environment. Like I would love to be able to have these giant spreadsheets open and not have to worry about screen real estate um, and not have to see any of my coworkers around me and stuff like that on a daily basis. Uh, but the problem is that because the screen is low resolution compared to, you know, the distance to your eye and all that type of stuff, looking at spreadsheets is probably the worst possible thing you can do in a VR headset. Like reading and editing a Word document is probably the next worst thing you can do. Um, so I think we, if anything, the Windows usage models actually require better screen technology than the gaming does. Because with gaming, you can do aliasing, anti-aliasing, you can have blurring effects, you can have all kinds of things that occur uh, to help. But when it comes down to viewing black text on a white page, screen door effect is... Uh, awful i would say um i i would kind of i at this point i would avoid the windows mixed reality headsets as, as they currently exist uh, but they do work with i believe they work with games in uh oculus or no not for the rift but for like uh, anything you can do through steam vr right if you can do it through steam vr uh then it will be able to be supported but obviously you won't have a controller thing right you'll have to use an xbox controller or a windows controller you won't have access to uh Oculus Touch or the Vive controllers. So, Marlo Mitchell wants to know: Having more cash seems to make everything better, from hard drives to SSDs to processors. But why? Is cash memory made from different materials that are faster than other types of memory? And if it's so fast, why don't manufacturers use even more of it, such as a gig of cash on a hard drive uh, or a processor instead of a few megabytes? Um, you are correct that having more cash is always better. Uh, I wouldn't even the, the the way I would think about it is don't think of cash different than memory. Think of it all as memory. And the closer you can get to the processor, whether it be a storage processor, or a system processor, or a GPU, the better it's going to be. The problem is the reason why you don't see a gigabyte of cash on an NVIDIA GPU is that its cost is very high. Uh, its die space is significant, right? So. Um, as you increase cache size, when you look at, say you look at like uh, the previous generation Xeon processors from Intel that have like 40 megs of L2 cache. If you look at those die images, they're actually like half cache, right? Which is, uh, does a lot for your uh, cost per chip when building these processors, right? So now, as an architect, you have to weigh the advantages of having this limitless amount of cash there uh, versus the the cost of including it, right? So is, is, is your system, is your out-of-order design, is your GPU implementation um, going to see a 10% improvement if you go from four to eight megs of cash, but it's going to cost you 30% more to implement that. That's the kind of decision that you're into, right? And if you look even at a processor like uh, an Intel, uh, modern Intel CPU, where you have L1 cache, you have L2 cache, uh, you have L3. Parts that had Iris Pro graphics had SRAM, they had L4 caches essentially. Um, the faster the memory, the more die space they take up, the more expensive it is to maintain and organize is essentially what it comes down to. And the same thing with, with hard drives, right? Uh, when we first saw hard drives with SSD caches implemented on them, there was the issue of uh, 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 you only had 10 megs or, or 10 gigs or then you had 20 gigs. And then it was like, well, at this point, now we just have an SSD on there. And you had the Western Digital Black uh, I forget what it was called, the Western Digital Black that was like a hybrid drive in it, but actually showed up to the system as a 120 gig SSD and then a one terabyte hard drive for mobile devices. Um, so all that stuff continues to exist. But the reason you don't see a gig of cache on uh, a processor is because of the cost, not because it wouldn't benefit them. Although you do see, you would likely see diminishing returns. It's, it's why technologies like HBM are so interesting because you're basically getting larger capacities of memory closer to the processor in order to make it 
faster overall. Same thing with Optane. Optane is interesting because it, you essentially get um, uh, the performance, you get most of the performance benefits of DRAM, but at a lower cost as well. And as Alex points out to us in our chat, there's actually a power consumption difference, SRAM versus DRAM, right? So when you get into that, it's another kind of cost issue to, to consider as you're, as you're designing a chip. Let's do one more. Uh, this one's from Kyle. Kyle User wants to know, uh, your Titan V review showed that the card has impressive relative perf uh, compute performance, but what is actual? What is the actual difference between single and double precision? Uh, so the it's actually kind of a misnomer because when you have a double precision compute, it's actually significantly more than double uh, uh, of the values, right? It's essentially the size of the variables that can be created or processed on, right? So a single precision is basically uh, 32 bits of uh, data that can be addressed, right? And you can use that to have larger numbers. You can use that to have higher precision numbers and more things after the decimal point. Whatever it is, it's going to be represented in those bits. When you go to double precision, you're actually doubling the number of uh, places, right? So you're going from 32 order of 32 to an order of 64, right? So now you have 64 uh, bits of data per per implementation, right? So um, it is the complexity of the number, whether it be uh, as big a number as you can get or as small of a number as you can get without being zero uh, is represented in that. So that's why um, for compute workloads where basically if you, if you try to think of it and as I try to take myself back to computer science classes from almost 20 years ago, or what have you. Uh, the idea of if you, ha if you have, you know, if you can only use four decimal points and you have to do a bunch of math on it, you're losing accuracy. The more, the more operations you have on that limited resolution of data. If you have a larger, wider resolution of that data, then your accuracy can be maintained through more operations. So when it comes to, um, you know, scientific computing and uh, drug creation and modeling and oil and gas industries, you need that accuracy. Uh, otherwise, you're just going to drill in the wrong spot and cost yourself a billion dollars. So that's why that exists. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us. Uh, if you have questions, leave them in the comments here on this YouTube video. Use them on the comments on PCPer.com. Uh, and I hope everybody has a great Christmas if you celebrate it. If not, have a great week, uh, and we'll be back with another episode before CES. So if you have any CES-specific questions, feel free to ask them as well, and uh, we'll, we'll include them uh, before, we, before we head out to Las Vegas. So that's it, everybody. Have a good one. Thanks. Mm -hmm.